Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is so wonderful to have you here this morning um, for the second part of our Atlantic gathering uh, with Kairos. My name is Allison Adder. I'm a member of the Atlantic Coordinating Committee for Kairos um, Canada. The very first thing I want to do this morning is turn to Ada, another member of the Coordinating Committee, um, who will offer a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Alison. Um, good morning, everyone. I am privileged to, to lead in this exercise as an immigrant of African descent. I, I want to acknowledge that I live and work in Halifax, which is a, a Mi'kmaq key area, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, whose ancestors have been living in this area for thousands of years. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wolasta Kuyik people first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolasta Kuyik title and established the rules for which was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. I want to invite all of us to wherever we are from, if we just uh, uh, put in the chat box uh, where you are from and acknowledge the land in which you are joining from. And there is also, Shannon has put a link for those who are not sure exactly where. You can just look at the link and uh, click, type your own city and um, the territory will appear so that you can acknowledge it. Thank you, um, Alison. Thank you so much. Um, and will folks just continue to add in the chat um, where you're joining from today? I'm going to invite uh, Elizabeth to offer a few words of welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to those of you who were able to be with us last evening. And welcome among us, those of you who are joining us for the morning. <clears throat> I shared earlier that um, I was deeply moved by what I heard last evening so that I lay in my bed, not sleeping, but pondering what I heard. And I hope that today we can continue our journey of listening and have opportunity as we gather together to explore and strengthen how we live into, tre into treaties and how the treaties that we are all part of live in us. We come together this morning to listen to each other with respect and openness. Opportunity to ask some of our questions. And as we do that, I want to just open with the same opening I used last night, just a few simple words of invitation to be here and to be present. So I offer, we are here, here we are, right here, right now, open. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. So that was Elizabeth Heater, a, another member of the Atlantic Canada Coordinating Committee. Um, many of you were here last night and we're just very pleased to have you back and we're, we're thrilled to have some others join this morning. Um, for those who weren't here last night um, and, and for all of us, um, just mention a little bit about what we did last night. Um, we were we were welcomed uh, very warmly to this uh, gathering, um, and then we were many of us were in the role of listeners last night, 
Um, as we heard from a circle um, of six, six women um, sharing um, th their responses to these, these um, questions or reflections, uh, what, what does it mean to live into treaties? How do treaties live in us? And um, throughout that very rich discussion, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, we heard um, a lot of themes come forward. And today we're hoping to take the conversation a little bit deeper. I'm gonna just check with another member of the courting committee, um, Linda Scherzinger, um, just to see if Linda wanted to add anything um, from last night in terms of um, just anything we should share with new participants joining this morning. Good morning. I would only share that it was a real privilege uh, to be able to listen into the circle and to get a sense of uh, what it means uh, to many who are so aware of the importance of the guidance of these treaties. And it is um, our privilege now to continue that conversation um, and to open it up uh, to everyone else. Um, we heard many, many views and experiences last night. And uh, now in a few moments of um, small group time, um, I think we're, um, we're honored to um, extend the opportunity of sharing. And um, Allison, I think, um, I think that's, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as Linda mentioned, what we will do is we'll be broken into very small groups um, just for about 10 to 15 minutes, a chance to share our own reflections, responses, um, and, and questions with one another. Um, so you're, you will be invited to join a breakout group of about three people. And the first thing I'll invite you to do is to introduce one another, um, especially if you haven't met before. Um, and then the first, in, then we'll invite you to share your responses if you were here last night. And maybe we'll, we'll give an opportunity for those who were here last night to share that first. If you're joining this morning, we'd still love to hear your thoughts, um, what you're coming with, your, your reflections on the meaning of treaty, and your, your questions or your, your, your curiosity, your openness. Um, after this time, um, we're gonna invite each group to share in the chat any question you have for our circle, kind of anything you wanna add into the wider conversation. So be, be sure to make a note of you know, anything that you, you wanna bring forward. Um, but other than that, of course, this conversation, you know, you can have among yourselves to try to just learn from one another and deepen um, understandings. I, I, I'm just gonna check if anyone has any questions before we do that to make sure that's clear. Um, I'll invite Shannon to go ahead and, and form the groups. Certainly if there are any questions, you can use the chat to reach us or um, or ask them at the at the time. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> I know it's always a bit abrupt um, when the groups end, <laughs> um, but thank you for um, for the conversation. I certainly want to thank my group. As I had mentioned, we do want to capture most, especially your your questions. Um, but it, it could be any comment that you, you really want to share with a group. Um, the easiest way to do it is going to be the chat. So feel free. It's a fine if two people write the same question. That's totally fine. Um, just if there's something that came out of your group that you're curious about or 
wondering about wanting to explore more, I'm going to invite you to put that right in the chat box. And we'll just take a couple of minutes to do that. That's also going to give a chance for our circle members to have a look at those uh, comments. I might read some of them out loud, but uh, for now, I'll just give a moment for folks to write. Ishpel, a question about uh, New Brunswick case. Beautiful personal personal interactions. Thank you. A question about youth. Question about what makes the peace and friendship treaties unique. That actually, that question was in our group too. Appreciate that. Another question about the situation in New Brunswick. Um, folk, perhaps someone in the circle will, will pick up on that. Um, looking for knowledge to discuss that with neighbors and friends. What does it look like for a settler to, to live within indigenous sovereign territory and treaty? Beautiful questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we did this did come up last night, the fishing, the situation in fishing communities, and I'm seeing that's being raised again. We will leave the chat open for a few moments. Um, I think before we open the circle, um, we're going to invite members, uh, just a few, a few members of the Atlantic Canada Coordinating Committee, some settler members, to share a few of their own reflections on our topic or on what you heard last night. Um, again, thank you so much for these, these beautiful questions. I'm going to turn to Diane Kleimenhag um, just for two or three minutes. If there was anything you wanted to share, reflect back on what you heard last night. Yeah, it was such a beautiful time of sharing. Um, I have pages of notes, so I'll try and keep it succinct. <laughs> Um, Mick Mahan, your statement about I'm homeless in my homeland. There are no long houses here. It reminded me of the Métis Cree author, um, Jesse Thistle. He did a definition on Indigenous homelessness, and he talked about the loss of place and land and culture as an expression of homelessness in Indigenous life. And, and also your idea of two worldviews coming together in the treaties. Um, so it's not enough for me as a non-Indigenous person to read the treaties and expect to understand them. I can never have a full understanding without having that conversation and relationship with the Indigenous peoples with which that treaty was made. And I think that was a really important teaching for me that um, I can't do this alone and we shouldn't do this alone because this was treaty was not made alone. And Kiana, um, I felt your anger and your sadness and your frustration in Juliana, you expressed this too. Um, you said that uh, to work and live in this hostile land is exhausting. And I was thinking that if non-Indigenous people do the work of understanding and living in treaty, that maybe that could alleviate some of that frustration and the anger. And, and so just seeing again, settler responsibility in, in the words that you're saying and how we continue to cause pain through denial and, and not living through the treaties. And Brittany, I heard your theme of education throughout you talking and I think that's amazing. And, um, but your, your comment about being conscious of the treaties and, and bringing them into your daily life and how to live them out intentionally. And also to, to, um, lean toward curiosity and away from fear uh, of what we don't know. I think that was a really important teaching too, because it is scary to tread into water that we don't understand. And sometimes if we just, if we're just curious, it can be so much easier. 
And Lisa, you spoke of the responsibility of passing down treaty and teachings to the next generations. And I realized at that time that I have that responsibility too. It's not just Indigenous people's responsibility to pass down the treaty knowledge. I don't know why that was it's like a light switch turning on. It's like, really? I didn't think of that before. Um, and also, it's not just head knowledge, right? It's, it's about the treaty of the rights being able to be lived out. And so what does that look like in life? And how can I, with whatever power and privilege I bring to a conversation, how can I make that a little bit easier for the, the living out? Um, Ishbel, you asked the question, um, what would life be like if we lived out the treaties? And uh, yeah, I got a lot of dreaming about that happening last night, but um, if we worked together and stood up to political powers that be and said jointly, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, that we won't allow these injustices anymore, we have a lot of power um, if we're allied and continue to work together. And then Lisa, you also asked why we have to assert our rights. And that's the last thing. That's what I'll, I'll leave it on. Why do we have to assert our rights? It, the word assert, I thought about that a lot. Um, there are so many things that I take for granted. And I was thinking about how the only time I, I have never had consistent access to clean water was when I lived in an indig indigenous community. And why should you have to fight every time you try and do something? Um, and I know you're all strong, capable women, but it's got to be exhausting. You shouldn't have to do that. And so I'm just, um, yeah, thinking back to, to Ishbel saying if we worked all together um, to not allow these injustices, what, what kind of work could we do? So those are some of my reflections from last night, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Diane. Um, Linda Scherzinger, would you like to add some thoughts about either what you heard or what it means to live the treaties? Yes, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't recall exactly who said what, but various um, words and thoughts um, and feelings did come clearly um, to me last night and um, have been uh, staying with me and I know will stay with me for a long time. The first, the first thing that struck me was uh, several references to language, the importance of and the threat to one's own language. It is our own, we don't realize it um, until it is uh, threatened, but it's our own language in which we feel and think and express our most intimate selves. I must admit that when I heard uh, language being talked about, it reminded me of a privilege that I had several years ago when I lived in Cape Breton, I hosted a visit of uh, two Guatemalan indigenous Mayan village teachers uh, visiting the Wagmacook School. And I heard those teachers from two very different countries and experiences share together their common struggle to be able to keep their own language. Uh, that um, that um, moment of um, being present to that sharing and that struggle um, has really uh, stayed with me. The second thing that, um, of course, the reference to language brought to mind is Rita's, Rita Joe's powerful poem, I Lost My Talk. It's not just powerful, but it's so full of pain. It is one of many examples of what has disrupted the natural passing on from person to person, from generation to generation of who one is and 
to give that um, confidence and sense of, um, of selfhood and purpose in life. Another word that struck me was the word internalize. Now, we settlers don't even realize how we have internalized our privilege, privilege in so many arenas, but we haven't really learned sufficiently and internalized the meaning of the treaties that should have been and continue to be guides of who we are, who our indigenous neighbors are, and how we are to live in mutually respectful and beneficial relationships. And a little bit like Diane, I was also uh, called to think about what if things had been different from the beginning? How much healthier, richer, more positive and hopeful all of our lives would have been and would be today if we had consistently taken those treaties to heart and within our social interactions and lived in such ways such as um, the wampum living that was referred to last night. When we are each living in our own ways of being, not disrupting or imposing one way on another, but being willing to listen, to learn from and to take responsibility for how we are to live in relation with each other and with the natural world within which we all live. And I guess finally, um, I heard the um, importance and opportunity of pausing from time to time to check on how are we doing at living together according to the guidance of the responsibilities in the treaties. So thank you for this opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, really appreciate those thoughts. I'm just um, checking the time. So I, I have been invited to share a few thoughts too, but I think I'll be very brief um, because we do have, um, like we do have um, a lot to cover this morning. I, I really appreciate it. Um, a few people had talked about the sense of um, responsibilities and relationships um, and um, our responsibilities to one another, our communities and the land. And that really resonated deeply with me. Um, I think in many settler communities, and, and some folks may have mentioned this, there is a sense of disconnect from ancestors and from culture and identity. And, and maybe that's related to a sense of internalized colonization. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's been so important to me to, to kind of understand deeper and deeper my own place in the world and history. And it's not all, um, you know, it's not all a positive history, learning about my own ancestors. Um, but I, so I, I, I feel like, it can be painful to learn what some of my ancestors did, but there's still a, a, a beauty in that connection and the ability to heal and do something different. So um, I'm in a, a certain spot in my life. I'm, I'm pregnant with my first child. Um, so I just wanted to share that I am carrying very seriously um, this responsibility to pass on um, hope and a, a, an understanding of the treaties and a commitment to to the land that um, that we live on. So I, I really warm thanks to everyone. Um, I, there's some beautiful comments in the chat here before we open the circle. I just wanted to mention them again. Um, 
Diane has posted uh, Rita Joe's poem, I Lost My Talk, which uh, is very meaningful words. Um, Ishbel has shared two YouTube videos. One is about treaties and one is about lobster and moose issues. And I, I know some of you may want to view those um, later on. Thank you so much. Um, we've mentioned many of the questions that have uh, been shared. We have um, a question here. There's a few more have been added. Question about education and really um, using the school system to, to have more education. That certainly came up last night. As a guest or an immigrant, um, could I genuinely make the Indigenous homeland my home? Beautiful question. Um, <clears throat> the territory is unceded. It's a question from Mohawk territory, but very appropriate here. The territory is unceded, um, but the treaty relationship has been governed by the Indian Act. So that is a question. There's a, I think there's a curiosity there. And there's also a question here about understanding the concepts and impacts of colonialism as a, as a historical process to, to, to um, acquire territory and limit access to resources. Um, certainly, <laughs> uh, I think that was touched on last night. There's a lot here and we know our circle may not be able to uh, cover everything. Um, but there's certainly an invitation um, to, to touch on some of the topics. I will say we'll end a little bit earlier than last night, simply because I want to spend a few minutes off, um, just talking about the next steps and, and, and offering some opportunities to get involved further. Um, but we do, we do certainly have time for a, a beautiful conversation, I believe. For those who are not part of the core circle, I'm gonna invite you to put your microphone on mute if you haven't already, and maybe even turn off your camera. Um, we wanna make sure that the internet is very strong so that we can hear our circle as much as we can. Um, and I think we'll probably turn the chat so that, oh yes, so that you can certainly contact Shannon, our tech host, if you need anything, um, but we'll focus our attention on listening. And I'm gonna turn it over to the circle at this time with thanks. I wanted to uh, share in my language gratitude as we open our circle. Chichahamijina, Chidiskamijina. We were them that delegate, we had the Majuahan Minet. We were them that delegate, we had Mokikanodi, Nestuodi. We had that Delmawali at Kisku. Offering thanksgiving to all the, the life source that sustains us all, the good life that's been gifted to all of us by our love of our ancestors, love from the land, our sacred mother, all the relations continually uh, remain open to, to nurture and care for us, shelter, feed us, and all. I'm always, um, that it's important for us to be able to be who we are, uphold our identity, especially on our homelands. So, and um, uh, that one, that's one of the things that uh, we continue to sit here in circles and to remain. Uh, oh, okay, I'm hearing uh, I'm not being heard too much. 
Am I breaking up? I'll pass this on to uh, Lisa and then uh, move around. Shivaliwin, uh, Nick Mahan, Ajibuli, Duxian, Ajiwaki, and Ludawe Wagan, Nilna, Ajibuli, Dahazi, Gizibaji, and Yed, Yud, Wijokam, and Wijokam, and Wuli. And I ask the uh, creator to be with us today and to, um, to help guide our words and what we need to say. Um, I guess I just reflecting on again, really what, what we spoke about last night, what really hit me, I guess at a very emotional level um, was the the angst of our young people, of, of um, the toll that it does take on your spirit and your body. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's hard. That's a heavy thing to carry when you're, when you're young and you're supposed to be vibrant and full of life. And um, you'll, you, you'll feel like that when you get to be my age, but not, you shouldn't be feeling like that right now. Um, well, I shouldn't say you shouldn't be, but, um, I think it's, it's makes me sad that you are feeling that way right now. Um, cause deep down in, and this is a quote from last night is deep down, we all need peace. And I thought that was so that, you know, it's such a simple statement, but it's so profound because we all do need peace in our lives. And, um, our spirits need that. I mean, we need to learn and grow and be challenged, but we all need to, to have peace around us um, to be well. Yes, we need clean water. We need, you know, clean air. We need food. We need, um, you know, we need to have fun, but we all need peace. And I think that, you know, that's something that our spirit really craves. And I think that um, our people understood that. Our people understood that balance and, and that we needed that. That was something that we needed to hold dear for our future generations. And I think, you know, this nation to nation agreement uh, with the treaties was, was with that in mind. It wasn't just for the, them at that time, but I believe they were thinking about you young people. They were thinking about us when they made those agreements because they knew, you know, things weren't going to get easier for us. They wanted it to be easier for us. And really, you know, um, they, they honestly and true, they, they, you know, we're sovereign nations. They, they believed in their heart. They didn't, I don't think they believed that they were inferior to the um, European settlers form of governance. You know, we had our own ways here. We had our own ways to, to be in the world. We had our own spirituality. We had our own way of dealing with uh, law we had our own ways of, of being. And um, because it was so very different from the Western European ways, they could not see, they could not see our ways. And I think, you know, that's misunderstanding created a lot of problems. Um, and thank goodness, like I said, uh, our ancestors had the foresight to know that they, especially with the peace and friendship treaties, that, you know, no surrendering of land. There was no surrender of land. And um, the other component of that treaty was to refrain from war with the crown. So that was in the treaty itself and live in peace with settlers. 
Um, you know, I think I, 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 you know, as far as, you know, our people have, have really tried to, to live that. I really do believe that. And like I said last night, the only time I think times when we're kind of forced out of that is when our rights are not being respected and honored. And usually it has to do with fishing or hunting or fowling or, um, you know, when we tried to feed and, and to try to make a living for our families, we should not be denied that. But that kind of forces us out of that peaceful place, because like I said last night is, you know, we're always having to assert our rights. And we should not have to do that. That weight should not be on us every time. And that's why it is difficult. I'll tell you, you know, a, a lot of people, um, I mean, I love my ind indigeneity and I, I do love walking this road. But it's a tough road. It is a tough road for you. You know, it has not been an easy path for me. Like, um, you know, you think about all of the, um, I mean, racism that you have to deal with because of people who don't understand and, and people who um, are either fearful or jealous or um, just, you know, don't want to accept who you are. And that's, that's a rough road to walk every day, every time you go out to the grocery store, every time you go somewhere in public, like it's just, you know, it, it's a rough road, but I think that, you know, together, it, the more people get educated, again, we talked about that last night, it's key. It's the key to this issue right now. And I think that, you know, we have to push it forward. Like, And I think as, as allies, it has to be pushed forward in our circles, but out there too, like to our people we put into power, to politicians, so that they know to honor um, the agreements. Um, and I think that's pretty much really what I wanted to emphasize today and, and say that I was truly honored to be in the circle with, with all of you, um, last night and, and glad that I've kind of had a chance to reflect on this topic, which I probably, um, don't think about enough, really. Um, and I was happy to force myself into uh, figuring out what that meant in our language. And uh, Lugadawagan is a treaty or the Great Peace Treaty. And I was digging again after I got off the Zoom call. And, and even in there, in that definition is kinship. And the word kinship. So I think to me, it really speaks about family too. You know, because we, you know, I think I read in somebody's comment, you know, could I ever become um, like a person of this land? I, you know, I, I think that that's po there's possible, you know, it's possible. But I think there has to be a big transformation of how we, we get to that point of kinship of, you know, looking out for one another having each other's best interests, you know, making sure we protect the waters and the waters are always there, going to be there for us and for our future generations. That's a huge responsibility. And, you know, that's, that's one of our hardest things right now is, you know, our grandmothers are going out to uh, on the water and protecting our waters. And uh, because they want to poison them. And, you know, that that cannot be allowed. Like, we have to protect our waters. We have to be there. Um, and, um, you know, there, there, there's cer certain things we cannot live without. And that's water and, and air and food. But, I mean, we have, to, we have to protect those dearly. And that is part of our obligation, our responsibility to each other. Anyway, Chiwalewin, and um, thanks again for for all of the wisdom around the table. So in my 
screen, I see Juliana, Brittany, Kiana, Ishbel. So I go next. Okay. Yeah, really, uh, really moving what you just said, Lisa, and talking about uh, our governance systems. And, you know, um, I'm a youth. I uh, studied, uh, I took a program that was uh, focused on Indigenous policy and creation of Indigenous policies. Um, so that was a roughly nine month course. And uh, I, I didn't know what to get out of that. I didn't know at the beginning what I was gonna get out of that. But towards the end, uh, especially in the six months, uh, I learned uh, a lot about how to deconstruct these policies as well. And uh, these policies that the Canadian government put on our people uh, to, you know, almost keep us where we are rather than letting us be who we are, you know, um, keeping us, how can I say that? The policies in the Indian Act are what really hinder uh, indigenous people, but we don't need those policies. We don't need the Indian Act. We have our own rights and we, we know our obligations. We already know this. And uh, it's just the Canadian government pushing that on us. And that's like through policies, that's through RCMP, that's in the healthcare system, that's everything about the Canadian system uh, has really uh, affected our people. And that's, uh, that's something that uh, the government needs to acknowledge as well. Um, they can say their words, they can apologize, but you know, it's about actions too. It's about letting us have our sovereignty, have our peace, you know, letting us live, letting us survive. You know, there, there shouldn't be any indigenous people homeless in Canada, in this, in this, uh, part of the world that we shouldn't be homeless. No one should be homeless, but, um, you know, it, uh, for me, I'm on a off reserve, uh, homeless initiative committee and uh, you know I see how much money the government gives uh, these kind of uh, organizations and it's it's a slap in the face you know you can't survive with that money that's that's a temporary solution and uh, for our indigenous people we have long-term solutions but the Canadian government just wants to keep putting patches and patches and patches on things and uh, when I think about the treaties, that's really like what brings us together. And uh, my dad's Willows to be and Mi'kmaq. My mom is Irish and Scottish. Um, so I have, like I said, a pretty mixed background. Um, and growing up, my grandfather, he always taught me about the land, the water, and he would teach me about my rights. And I didn't realize like that's what he did when I was a child, but he was, helping me reaffirm my rights saying, you know, Joel, you go fishing, you go hunting, you don't need the government, don't worry about them, just do it. And uh, that's the kind of attitude he had towards, you know, the system that he was in. My grandmother it was the same way. She spoke her language. She didn't, she didn't care who was around, she would speak her language. And, you know, um, I never got to learn the language, but I got to listen to the language and I got to listen to their stories. And, uh, a big part of a big part of what I do now is um, kind of preserving those oral history stories or teachings and preserving them uh, digitally so future generations can have access to those. Um, I know I would have appreciated uh, the work that I did as a child, you know, <laughs> or even like you know, I really wish that um, there was more resources for our our youth to go and use um, and that that ties in with you know the policies that are in place you know keeping us away from all that you know we are trying to anyway I don't sorry I don't let the I don't let the government stop me from you know and I don't let the government their laws and policies stop me for what I'm going to do with my life and my roles and responsibilities and um, I stand firmly with that and uh, I've always been like that when, I've always been like this since I was a child. And uh, I always ask difficult questions, you know, um, 
And that's a very important part. And people might think they're difficult or they might think my views are radical, but they're not. Um, I speak from the heart. And uh, I think a lot of indigenous people do speak from the heart. And uh, like I said last night, uh, you can learn a lot and heal a lot with indigenous wisdom. And uh, I'll end it on there, Walio. I'm not sure who's next, so I might just go. <laughs> Um, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I feel really privileged to have been in this space last night and to be here again. Uh, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, but, you know, doing this as hard as conversations might be, it feels like for me, at least like this is good medicine for me, uh, gathering within circles. Uh, I've always really enjoyed, um, connecting to the people within a circle and listening to their stories and their experiences because there's just there's so much we can learn from other people's experiences and I find that so valuable um I wrote some notes <laughs> and um there are a few things that even um people are saying today that are just kind of bringing about some questions and some thoughts that I have. Um, but one thing where uh, Kiana and Juliana spoke about burnout last night, um, nice. we're covering from a burnout this summer. <laughs> like burnout is very, very prevalent. And I would say, especially oof, within our youth and even our elders, I just feel like they're, uh, there's so much responsibility that are on our shoulders and that's very prevalent when we talk about treaties, how one-sided the responsibilities have been. Um, and also how Lisa spoke about, you know, this, this path isn't an easy one to walk. And again, I find I have an interesting perspective on this because I grew up most of my life thinking that I was you know, just white. I didn't think I was Indigenous. I didn't know for a very long time. Um, and that switch when I was stepping into culture and when I started decolonizing and throwing myself into these spaces, even though I didn't feel fully ready, like even though I felt scared to do so, the journey of beginning, and I would say within this past year and a half, I cannot tell you how privileged I've been growing up. Like from then versus now being integrated into my culture, there have been so many things that have happened in this year and a half that I cannot, like, I cannot fathom that like parents have to prepare their children um, for all these microaggressions, for the racism that's going to come along, for the way that our people are being treated and it's not even being talked about like me coming in very late I wasn't prepared for any of that and I'm I'm still trying to figure out how to to take care of myself within these spaces now because it's very difficult work it's very difficult work and it's really hard experiences and you know not only is there the intergenerational trauma that's coming from like our grandparents and our great-grandparents and like their ancestors but our youth and our elders are experiencing their own traumas within what's happening to our people. And it's still happening every day. <laughs> um, I could not get over like just in one year, like every few weeks, there was just something else that just kept coming up. Like, especially with like our, you know, like our treaties being violated, our rights being violated, us being violated as human beings, not even just as indigenous people, but as human beings there's just so much trauma. Um, and I was very surprised and I wasn't ready for that. And I have to think about how strong our people are, even from the beginning, just how strong like our ancestors have been, especially like thinking in context of like seven generations. Like that's, that's how we think in our culture. We think about the seven generations ahead of us. Um, and it's 
it's clear that like, you know, the other side with like the government, you know, they don't think that far ahead. They don't think seven generations ahead for their children and for their people and how, um, even out of context for humans, like there's no perspective of how we're gonna preserve mother nature or the animals or the way that we're gonna to continue to have clean water and to continue to have food so we can eat in the future. Like, oh my goodness, I just think that's crazy. But I really did wanna talk about uh, that, that burnout that we all feel because we we've been like, like shoved all the responsibility and it's become a burden in some ways to hold all that responsibility and wanting to help our communities it's fulfilling it's very fulfilling like I haven't felt anything like being in this type of community before in my life I've never felt a sense of community before stepping into my culture and it's been beautiful but it's so hard to see the people that you love being in pain and suffering from preventable things. Like, like all this pain could be preventable if there was just more effort and a more wanting to understand uh, if, the, if compassion was more like if it was cultivated. Um, it just blows my mind that you know all these things are preventable if people just wanted to try um goodness there's so many things that i want to talk about today um juliana was talking about um you know digital access and wanting resources and wishing that we would have had that uh when we were a little younger within our youth and i i share that wanting I still want it because you know it's not always easy to access elders we we don't have as many elders as you know so many years ago we don't have as easy access to our knowledge as you know we did before colonization and that in itself is it's kept up by layers of trauma um because when I wanted access to my culture when I started learning that I was Indigenous and wanted to know what that meant, I had no one to turn to. I couldn't turn to my Indigenous father because, um, you know, he was a product of the 60s scoop. And somewhere down our line was most likely the product of residential schools, uh, which, you know, just cut off ties to our knowledge in regards to our culture. Um, so then that left me disconnected and not knowing. Um, and I would have wished that we had digital access. Like, I, I wish I could just Google or like find a list of all these knowledge keepers and elders that I can go to if I have questions and like, and to connect. But I feel like that's a reality that's slowly coming, but we didn't have that when we were younger. I'm hoping for the younger generations that we will. Um, I, uh, I know I spoke yesterday very briefly that, um, I built up a program called Project AIR and the purpose of that program is to do exactly like what me and Juliana are talking about. Um, I wanted to collect accessible knowledge about our culture through uh, elders and knowledge keepers uh, interviewing and just having conversations and listening to teachings. And I really wanted this for our indigenous youth. Um, more, more recently, I've been like, becoming more aware of how important it is to have allies as well and finding knowledge for allyship and how we can live together, how we can live together within our treaties uh, and within, you know, hopefully reciprocal relationship for the future. Um, and I'll, I'll talk on one more thing before I pass it on. <laughs> that kind of goes with that. Um, I saw a question in the chat about education and, um, and schooling. I find what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm collecting education, I'm collecting knowledge. I would like to have an educational database because right now it's, it's so slow to get, thing, to get the government to do things. And in my perspective, does the government really wanna teach anything about our culture if, you know, let, let's face it, like 
they committed genocide on our people and they've been hiding our history for so long. They continue to hide our history today. I mean, we're going through different areas where residential schools and we're looking for the mass graves of our children. And there's, there's still just, there's so much hesitation on the government's part. So for me, I don't have trust or I don't rely on the government thinking that they're going to educate our students to like the capacity where they need to be knowledgeable to even enact and like practice our treaties. Because that's all information that they have or that they have knowledge on at some capacity, but it's been restricted for generations. That's why we're here. So when I think about Project AIR, um, I've had conversations with Juliana to the point where, you know, I think that Project AIR is a sovereign way for me to collect education and knowledge for our people. And I think for now, like that's what we have to do so we don't have a reliance on the government. It would be lovely if the government could have curriculum about our history and about our people. I think that would be amazing because again, education at such a young age, just it, it'll make things easier and it'll probably open up that compassion, that empathy for people at a very young age, but I'm not reliant on it. But uh, yeah, I'll stop there guys. <laughs> uh, we'll all in. Hi guys. Um... I'm not sure what to say today. Uh, I'm just going to do a little show and tell. This is um, one thing I really uh, have a lot of gratitude towards Mika Mahan for because if it wasn't for her, I don't think our community would even have taken the step in this direction with for uh, the moose hunts and the workshops that we have been taking on for the past two years to start, you know, incorporating that knowledge into our community. <clears throat> I'm sorry guys and I know how we how you mentioned uh Brittany you know sometimes it feels like it's hard when you're just one person and you know like that made me think of like the with the moose hunts you know I, I feel like I've gained so much knowledge even just it's helped me really grasp a stronger sense of identity as a Mi'kmaq woman and um you know like with moose hunts it's not it's never just about one person you know there's no I I don't think it's it's actually even possible for you know one person unless you're like in a an extremely experienced hunter to be able to uh, do that by yourself. And so, you know, even just like the way that we all gather together, you know, it's very, it feels very uh, organic. It feels very, you know, familial, you know, everyone's together, everyone's laughing, everyone's feeding, everyone has a job and no one is more important than the other. Everyone is contributing in a way that, you know, when you go home at the end of the day, you say like, wow, we did this. And, um, so for, for one of our moose hunts that we went on this year, uh, as soon as we downed our moose and we were walking over to it, I looked down and I found this here. I don't know if you could see it that well. And it's a, it's an arrowhead. And I found it about 50 feet away from where we downed our moose. And so it, uh, it always, it, it elicits like an emotional reaction in me because it, it's, you know, like physical proof that, you know, we're, providing for ourselves and our family in the exact same way and the exact same places as our ancestors did you know that's that's literally like you know us living our treaties right there so uh, and and another thing that I really enjoy about this process is you know I always think of it is the children you know when we came home last uh last year we were a little late for the workshop uh I think it was supposed to end at about five and we showed up at six with the moose but um, when we showed up, all the kids were there, you know, everyone brought their kids because, you know, it's, 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 it's organic. It's, it's feels like at home, you know, it's, it's something we do as a community. And as soon as we pulled in, you know, we were all tired, but all the kids came running out. I, we felt like celebrities there said, you got the moose, you got the moose. And it was just such an awesome feeling, you know, and that's just, you know, one more example of really, you know, like living into the treaties, you know, it's, those little kids like having that experience I, I never had that experience as a kid and you know that's the work that we do today is really you know changing lives for the future so that's that's all I have to contribute to for today so thank you guys for providing this space
Thank you. Um, oh, so many thoughts swirling around in my head. Um, thinking about what Lisa was saying and um, the pain that it hurts hearing the young ones talking about the burnout and the anger. Um, so it got me thinking back to when I was younger and I was working with um, on issues of around Indigenous prisoners and, um, you know, trying to get elders and sweat lodgers in. And there was so much injustice, just so much injustice. And um, I'd be, you know, writing letters to Indigenous prisoners, trying to give them some hope and connecting them. And I remember one elder telling me at that time um, that when you're dealing with so much injustice, that there's a kind of a line. And, and the way he described it was that if I became full of rage, then I became just like what I was fighting against. And that I had to keep what he called righteous indignation, sort of that, yes, it's an injustice and not going over to that point of pure rage and anger. Um, so I've struggled with that, but it's something that I've kept as kind of a teaching when I do get just full of anger, kind of trying to bring myself back to that place. But I also feel that the youth are totally justified to have their anger. And so when statues were being toppled and things and different people were saying, no, no, that's not our way. And the whole unmarked graves and the different impacts on the different generations. Um, and my daughter was reaching out to a lot of people. She's both Scottish and indigenous um, and you know, went to school in Eskasoni. Um, one of her roommates committed suicide around that time, or one of her classmates. So there was just a lot happening and the amount of anger that was going on. And I thought it's completely justified because the, the youth are looking at, wait, you know, our elders told their stories of living through residential school. It was on front page in the news, yet didn't believe them. But now you do that bodies are found like I get that anger. Why didn't you listen to our elders? Why didn't you believe them? So I totally understand the anger. Um, and I think that it's also a hard place to live in that anger, right? Um, when you're looking at the, you know, the lobster people, you know, the, the places being burnt and all that violence. Um, it's horrifying and it does have a direct impact on your bodies and your emotions and, and all those things. Um, and that's where COVID makes it hard because normally we would gather to gather strength from each other, right? And we would gather to have ceremonies to do healings with each other. Um, and so, you know, thinking about how do we do that? How do we, like Brittany said, be able to connect to an elder? Um, and so you made me think about, we were doing this series called Wabanaki Knowledge Keepers and having elders come together and it's probably time to bring that back again. And we also did like check-in circles and sometimes people wouldn't say one word, they'd just be there. But listening to their elders, watching the elders pray and smudge, sometimes having pipe ceremonies, even online was helpful, right, to help build people up. So thank you for reminding me of the importance of, of um, continuing that work so that people can continue to feel held. Um, yeah. And amount, around the whole Indian Act, we talked about that in our small group about how when you're talking about treaties, the government thinks, well, I negotiate with the band councils but the band councils are actually a government institution and are controlled by the government. And so thinking about the work to bring back the traditional governance, which um, Megan Mahan can talk about for her district and is now happening down in district one, but how, and the Wulustuk have the grand council, but how do we spread that way of being um, and the particular challenge around the Grand Council of the Mi'kmaq, which is based on the Catholic Church and doesn't involve any women, 
um, and yet the Mi'kmaq are matriarchal. So how do you have a grand council that doesn't have any voice for women? And one of our members, Sherry Picto, has now been asked to be some kind of advisor to them. So it's great that they're finally getting a clan mother in there, um, and that's a start. Um, and I think the main thing is around to keep that is around hope, which is so hard when we're looking at the climate change and COVID and all these different things, right? How do you how do you find hope? Um, and for me, um, it has to come from creator, right? Like it has to come from, um, from the spirituality and from those connections to both Mother Earth and to creator and yeah, and from the ancestors and thinking about those teachings. And when I see things like the wampum workshop that we did last weekend and the amount of hope mm -hmm and uplifting that that brought to people. And so thinking about those things, um, the star teachings and, you know, just the things that can help to bring hope and how important that work is. And I just feel um, very honored and touched to be in this circle. Um, and then my heart feels for all you young, young ones. And I, I'm at an age I can call you young ones, although you may not think of yourself that way. Um, but yeah, just to know that, you know, we are, we are thinking about you and we are trying to hold you and that you don't hold all the responsibility, that there's others that are walking with you. And, um, some of the older ones that maybe were in the front lines 30 years ago are not, but there is still a role to play and still there for guidance and still, you know, we've been involved in a lot of struggles and certainly there for you. Walalan, Tabalat. Thank you, Ash and Lisa. Uh, Lisa. So, thank you. Um, so I really appreciate uh, And for me, in see, uh, bringing us together here and uh, um, the invitation of Kai Ross uh, and having the opportunity to also bring our community together to hear each other is really important. Much gratitude uh, for that. And I miss, I miss all of you uh, very much. Um, and I wanted to respond to a couple of uh, questions on the chat about land being, uh, if you're not Wabinaki and being connected to the land and uh, yesterday, when, we were sharing, uh, when I was sharing, reflecting about uh, our ancestral connections and uh, uh, the original languages of the, those ancient cultures and reconnecting to that, uh, holds that knowledge for all. And um, how, you know, when reflecting back with the history, how things were like for us here when we pick talk about Euro Europeans we've kind of melted everybody into that uh, space when we have all those clans in Europe historically like the Irish the, um, the Scottish you know all, all the uh, the clans of those lands uh, had a, a place uh, of their connection and so it's not when you begin to begin those first step to researching your ancestry. Uh, I think it's, I uh, really appreciate uh, Ishbel drawing on that yesterday about a way of doing that. And uh, so those are some of the, I keep recommending our settler families uh, who are here on our land, on our homelands, of our ancestors uh, to begin to uh, look and reconnect with with uh, those um, you know the, um, relationships, uh, and it has to start with your connection to to the land and how important and that is when we talked about treaty and uh, uh, what responsibilities are there and. 
I could see uh, the disconnect that has happened and more recently for us as indigenous people that are here as uh, with the settlers, it's been much longer and we've seen the impact and it's, uh, you've been, it's, I've, through the indigenous, through my eyes, what I witnessed is uh, you've recovered from colonization historically, and now you're uh, on another stage of journey of that acceptance of colonization and have, as I hear over and over, uh, uh, entitled or uh, privileged, uh, looking at uh, living in a model of colonization as privilege. Uh, I think we need to really look at uh, those foundations that we're standing on and I, uh, how we're identifying ourselves to those systems. Uh, uh, so for me uh, and what I've learned on the blueberry fields sitting with my sisters and my little my cousins and my aunts and my grandmothers. It's where I learned about my language, learned about the importance of sharing, uh, tolerance, dealing with the mosquitoes, uh, you know, and being present. And um, uh, that being supported uh, by the, the maternal system maternal way of life. I think it's, uh, that's what we need to uh, bring, bring above uh, these uh, systems, imposed systems. All the undergrowth is really the same for all of us, the love of motherhood, mother nature, uh, being with each other as a family, valuing uh, uh, bringing value back into motherhood, into uh, uh, families with each other, communities with each other, and bringing all that back above these uh, imposed systems and bringing humanity on uh, to grow over just as the, uh, the land will grow over on top of all these systems. Uh, that's who, who we are as a life Course. And um, it's so simple. Uh, and I think we need to bring that simplicity back in our lives because it's how nature, to observe nature, the true, the true uh, guide. And I could see why we've been misrepresented because we're talking about uh, those two, those two um, sovereign nations that we are a nation from coming from a mother-based foundation, uh, a matricultural society, as opposed to a paternalistic uh, system that knows what is right for uh, everyone. And those, uh, those, the pillars of that system is broken apart because they are maintained and controlled only a very small few when our maternal uh, uh, matricultural way has been always been inclusive, uh, you know? And so, uh, and that, those, those teachings and that way of life comes from the land. Uh, and, I, you know, I know we have a short time here, but I just want to go back to that question about uh, how could we be uh, could we be connected if we're settlers on no settlers on the land? Of course, because yesterday when I uh, shared about the the teachings about the deeper we are connected to our ancestral roots, uh, we, well, we're all in the same place because we're all being, we've all been taught no matter where we're at, where we come from on our mother earth on this planet, we're being taught by that same being, this, uh, our mother earth, and uh, the heart is at the center. And I, I think we need to, uh, uh, the treaties are a reminder, a post to remind us about uh, 
uh, what our history and who we are, our marriage to each other. And those are commitments that we made with our, with, uh, our sacred relations, uh, with uh, our uh, commitment to God or Janiska for us. Uh, and so the ceremonial part was in place when those treaties were formed. And it was at the time when our ancestors were uh, in a place of privilege and in a place of, the, uh, they were more in a place of uh, advanced position. Uh, but because of that, because of who we are and uh, a mother-based culture, all and, and loving all life, this is what we've extended in the longhouse, from the longhouse. And I can see why uh, the longhouses were uh, destroyed because it truly represented a mother base way of being and everyone everyone had a voice and we moved as a collective and because just uh, recent this without history just recently for our community when we went through the vision uh, wars. It was because those wars took uh, place again because we we had to uh, ten years to fight uh, in our system, fight for the treaties, and ten years, ten million dollars cost for our uh, uh, rights to be affirmed in the Supreme Court of this country. And so. Uh, and today, each time when we're, our communities are growing, we're expanding, and we, we're being denied of, of being on uh, to to live and to thrive in our uh, homelands, to build longhouses, truly longhouses. I don't think anyone has ever experienced longhouses in the Wabanaki. So, in in building. Uh, a future together, dreaming together. I want us to dream about uh, building and raising longhouses that are supportive of all life, supportive of everyone living here on our sacred mother, caring for the, uh, uh, our relations, the four-legged, the winged ones, the fish, uh, and the ones who uh, are living under our feet. Um, and I want to be able to, to be speaking in our language and that you grandchildren, the settlers and all to understand me when I'm speaking in our language. All right. This is the first language that was ever sounded out in, uh, in Wabanaki. And it's now uh, we're just recovering from it, from being outlawed. And I, uh, in listening to the younger people when they're researching and they come in, you know, and they say, oh my goodness, now I know why the language was outlawed. Because it holds such knowledge and it, uh, this access about who we are as human beings. Uh, has all that information in it. And we are much more than what we've been led to believe. And we want to invite you to have tea, as Lisa and I had shared the other day. <laughs> you know, oh, these invitations are nice, but it's based on, is it, uh, it's based on relationship. If it's something that, uh, is uh, mandated uh, for you to do just to and then to check off something that you fulfilled an obligation. It's not ever going to be enough, and that's been our relationship in the future, uh, in the past. Moving forward in the future uh, is about those uh, ways of coming together and 
building relationship, building friendship. And uh, I get too emotional when I get too deep, but uh, I'll let go, I'll, I'll stop here. And uh, those are the recommendations that I would encourage you to, to you know, to uh, look into. First, find out who you are. Uh, all those wonderful ancestral heritage that we all hold to bring forth uh, and, and to be with each other, not to have a, a, an institution or other uh, like governments represent us, different institutions outside of us represent us and because we've been misinformed so much in the past. Lalia. Thank you. I want to take a moment to offer very, very warm thanks to, first of all, to you, Meg Mahan, uh, for your, your words today and your ongoing work and your help also organizing this circle and uh, bringing us together. It's, it's so deeply appreciated. And to the members of the circle, uh, Lisa, Ishbel, Juliana, Brittany, and Kiana really can't say enough. Um, thanks for the, 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 the wisdom, the hope, the struggle, everything that you've shared. Um, I think at this point, um, what I'm going to do is um, open the chat just in case others want to add words of thanks. I, I think I've technology. Yeah. Um, so if others do want to add words of thanks, you should be able to do that now. Um, if we were in person, <laughs> as, as uh, Meg Mahan said, we, we would certainly um, have a token to offer you of thanks, but we'll have to send that by mail. But the, um, the, the gratitude uh, we want to take the time to express um, right now. Allison? Yes. I would also like to take this moment to, because um, we talked a lot about education. Um, and I think further educate, I noticed there were some links posted and, yes. you know, if those could be sent out to people, as well as, um, I, I'm sure you must be familiar with Marie Batiste um, Living Treaties. Um, but I think this is another, for those of you who like to read, um, is an excellent book on uh, living treaties and it's by Marie Batiste. She's a well-known Mi'kmaq academic and um, she's put together um, and interviewed a series of, or, or various authors in this book um, talking about the treaty relationship and um, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing yet, but what I've read so far is very, very good. And it's a, it's an excellent way to expand your knowledge about treaties and, and what other Indigenous people are thinking about the treaties as well in this country and how to move forward in a, in a respectful relationship. Thank you very much. Um, it's a wonderful recommendation and also agreed. Um, perhaps we can send the name of that book as well as some of these links to um, webinars and videos. I know many of us will want to continue the conversation and learn more, um, deepen our understanding. So that's one opportunity. Um, we'll, we will share that information. Um, we wanted to mention a few other opportunities um, to, to get involved or to carry on some of these conversations. And I'm going to call on Elizabeth first, um, just to tell a little bit about a small prayer group that we have that anyone would be very, very welcome to join. Thanks, Allison, and thank you to the circle. You've given us much to journey on with and to find new ways of coming together. 
On Wednesday mornings at nine o'clock, there is a small group of us who get, meet together um, <clears throat> for a time of prayer and reflection, specifically focused on our relationship and responsibility as treaty people. And uh, we'd be very happy <laughs> to have any of you who are here uh, join us in that gathering. Um, I, perhaps I could put my e email address in the chat. And if you would like to join that group, please do email me and I will send you the link. And uh, we would look forward to welcoming you with us. We meet <clears throat> usually from nine and and sometime we aim to end at 10. But sometimes we get going in conversation that takes us a little bit later, but we do try to keep it from nine to 10. And it is a time of both coming together to uh, hold an hold ourselves in relationship with creator together and to uh, do some reflecting on what it means for us to be together in as treaty people. So I'll just put my email address in the chat and you're welcome to join if you would like, just email me. Thank you. Um, and maybe we can also include your email address in an email to participants, um, but certainly take it right from the chat. We'd love to have you. Um, Brian Gifford and Linda Scherzinger are involved in a interfaith group. And I'd like to invite one, one or both of them just to share a little bit about that. Okay, uh, perhaps. I can help, and then if Linda wants to add anything, that would be great. Uh, when the fishery dispute arose a couple of years ago in St. Mary's Bay, there were a number of members of different faith traditions who were cons very concerned about it and wanted to express solidarity. So we... Uh, organized a visit to Sonyaville and uh, participated in a, a circle led by Doreen Bernard, which was very moving and, and other others uh, who were there at the site. And, um, and then later when it reignited uh, in, the, in the spring, uh, we uh, had a we tried to figure out how to respond as things were, were rapidly developing. And we, um, we, the main thing, because of COVID, we weren't able to actually visit and to do things in person. So we did a, we organized a sort of a joint um, session of prayers in various uh, faith communities around the, around the Atlantic region, especially in Nova Scotia. Uh, lately, we haven't been as active. There was a letter written recently uh, spearheaded by Nancy Lee at Tata, the Tatamugish Center um, to uh, express uh, our deep concern at the New Brunswick government's decision to disallow uh, expressions of, um, you know, acknowledgement of, uh, of land and treaty obligations in New Brunswick government uh, uh, meetings. And so that was sent off. So we, we haven't been as active lately, but we are, uh, and there's been some turnover in our membership through career changes and so on, but uh, we would welcome, uh, I can put my email in the address in the, in the chat and we would welcome uh, other people uh, joining us so that when we do develop actions, we can let you know about them and, and you can participate in, in helping us figure out how to, how to be supportive of treaty rights. So Linda, if there's anything you'd like to add, that would be great. Thank you, Brian. Um, I think that really is the message 
Um, it's not that uh, there are particular actions that are engaged in uh, frequently, but it is a supportive group that um, I kind of envision as standing by when needed to stand up for, for uh, rights and responsibilities uh, um, for the treaty rights. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And again, um, we'll, we'll try to include that contact information for anybody who would like to join or get involved or learn more. Um, I think the other thing I'll mention is our own um, Atlantic Canada coordinate, uh, Atlantic Coordinating Committee of Kairos Canada, which is the group that has hosted today's gathering. Um, we would certainly welcome new, new participants of any kind. Um, and we have one specific task that we um, we're hoping a kind-hearted volunteer may step forward to take, which is the role of treasurer. Um, it's a very simple role. We don't spend a lot of money. Um, we have just as a small, um, a small grant we receive each year. Um, and we, we often use it to host a gathering such as this or a similar project. Um, but of course we do need someone to manage it. Um, it would involve opening a, a, a simple bank account and uh, just writing a few checks a year and preparing a very simple financial report. If you're interested in that, um, just let us know. And I'm sure um, we could find a way to work with you to it would be ideal if you were interested in that role, you could come right on as a member of our coordinating committee. But even if you weren't able to, um, if somebody was able to help with that task, that would be very warmly appreciated. And, and of course, um, your other contributions are very welcome to our committee um, is some, most of the members are new and we have a quite a flexible um, program. So any opportunities, um, you know, to, to promote um, justice and the integrity of creation are very, we're very open to them. And we, we want to continue this conversation too. Um, if there's um, interest and willingness, I mean, we can certainly um, open up more opportunities for folks to participate. Uh, yeah, I think I just want to, I think what I'm going to suggest um, as we come to the end is perhaps we can return to, oh yeah, right. Um, we can return to a, a gal review if folks know how to shift their computers. I'll just remove the spotlights. Um, and if folks want to turn your cameras back on, you're very, very welcome to. Um, ideas for continuing the conversation, we'd invite them both either in the chat or just in our final few minutes, if you want to share right out loud, um, interested in hearing from members of the core circle themselves of any um, upcoming opportunities or opportunities to continue this conversation um, or from anyone um, who'd like to share an idea. That is uh, Alonzo Lashir. Uh, I came in late this morning. I was having problems connecting. Uh, I find the topic was interesting, but I, I like to go deeper in the situation uh, about treaties uh, and look at the uh, question of uh, how tribes and cultures uh, fall into the dominant tribe or dominant culture. And to me, treaties are not the crux of the problem but it's the process of colonizations that human beings have done for a couple of 5,000 years. And uh, we have a group called Wampum Guatak, and we've had some discussions on there and also some Zoom and also some historical background. I see the process of colonization uh, rooted in the DNA of human beings and their tribes. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the um, process of colonization as run by the Egyptians, by the Romans, by the Germans, by the French, by the English, on and on and on, 
And being Acadian also, it was Great Britain at one point that did colonization. Uh, the process is very, very much the same. And I call it almost in our de cultural DNA. Uh, one of the atrocities we remember is, of course, the one with Nazi Germany. But whether you look at the process that Great Britain did or the process that France did in the different places to colonize, the steps are exactly the same as what was done to the indigenous people in North and South America. And having met people from South Africa, people from the Middle East, where there's an ongoing colonization going on, uh, people from the indigenous uh, people in different areas of North and South America, and people in Guatemala, the techniques are exactly, exactly the same. Treaties then become irrelevant because it's a dominant class that rules. Uh, I don't like the term, what is the government doing for us? Because the government that's there is elected by the people that want things exactly the way it is. Uh, I see elements of uh, what, what uh, complicity. I see uh, things, I think we have to go back and see why human beings, human tribes, human cultures need, want to, and affect dominant uh, in, in, over other cultures and then look at, to me, treaties are just a tool. The whole issue goes, goes almost down to the DNA, our cultural DNA. So, so that's where I, I see the things in a certain way. Thank you. Thank you. Alanta, what did you say was the name of the group that you're with? It's a uh, Wampum Votox. It's on Facebook. It, it's a closed group, but anybody can join. There were a uh, discussion in the group to make it open or closed, but uh, and I did, I did post it in the chat there. I, oh, thank you. And I wanted to point out, too, that um, Diane has has offered an invitation in the chat for those who um, would like to read Living Treaties by Marie Batiste, the book we just heard about with her in the new year. Um, she would welcome that. Her email address is there. And uh, again, we, we'll try to compile um, some of these opportunities. Um, I've just had a request to ask just a show of hands um, if you'd like to continue, if you'd like to uh, meet again to work more on this topic or to continue the conversation. And you can raise your physical hand or you, there's a way on Zoom to do it if you're familiar, uh, either is okay, <laughs> just to get an idea. Uh, thank you so much. It, it looks like there is a lot of interest. Um, yeah, we'll, Allison, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Allison, I, I think now um, maybe if folks could put their hands down for this one, we're going to, I'm going to ask for hands on a different question. Okay. Because the follow-up question is who would be interested in helping to set that up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. <sighs> and it could be a one-time thing. It could be an ongoing thing to have uh, a conversation around what do we do? How do we do this? That is not the part that people are interested in. <laughs> 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 All right, the coordinating committee will take that back and see what we do with that. Uh, fair enough, too. And I, I realize we're sort of putting folks on the spot, but Shannon, maybe we can, in our, our follow up email, just include if folks, uh, maybe even more specifics if folks did want to step forward and help. Elizabeth, did you have a comment? Oh, maybe not. I just thought I saw her raise her hand. I think maybe she was willing she's, to help organize. Maybe she's <laughs> frozen. Oh, that's okay. We will uh, we'll, um, talk to her soon. Um, we are coming to the very end of our gathering. And um, I want to thank everybody for taking part. It's been, it's been such a privilege to share in the conversation. Um, I think I, I will just offer a very brief word of prayer, but then I'll invite you if you want to take your microphone off mute and just say goodbye. It'll be uh, beautiful. Um, and, and of course, any other messages you want to add in the chat will be welcome. Um, 
but I, I'll, I'll just offer this prayer. Um, God, our creator, first we pray thanks for this land, for all peoples, and for the, the openness and courage that has been shared here. Kindle our imaginations, give us the peace we long for, and, and guide us all together in our uh, relationships and our work together for the good of all, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Feel free to take off mute and just say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much for hosting everyone. us. Bye. Wonderful. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for us to think Thank about. You. A privilege. Wonderful. We're learning. <laughs>